I'm so glad that you are able to join us this evening for another World Changers Bible Study. Thank you for being with us today. Um, we are into a brand new series entitled, What in the World is a Christian? What in the World is a Christian? Last week, we began by saying, first of all, the Christian is a son. And we did the first part of that. Today, we want to look at the second part of that, highlighting the fact that the Christian is a son. When you are a Christian, you are a son of God. I hope that you stay with us as we go through this session. If it's the first time that you're joining us, we want to invite you to go on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel and check out the other series that we would have done prior to this one. And also check out what we did last week because it helps you to be able to appreciate what we are doing in this segment. So the Christian is a son. Last week, we talked about the mystery of being a son of God. We looked at the passage that said that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And, and so Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And we said that this new birth makes you a son of God. We also looked at the miracle of being a son, highlighting the fact that as a son of God, it is not a, a tiny step that you take that just gets you over the line. Um, I, I do reference to myself the fact that I was uh, born and raised in the church, but I had not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and we are saying that there are people that attend church and believe that because they're good people, they do good deeds. All they need to do now is maybe get baptized or just take a little step over the line. But we are saying that it is a miracle because you are moved from death to life. That's not just a tiny little step. Um, but it means that you are moving from one kingdom to another kingdom and there is a miracle that is involved. There is a transformation of life that takes place. There's a kind of metamorphosis that takes place in the life. Any man in Christ is a new creature. All things have passed away and all things have become new. Your past is wiped away, wiped clean and, and God gives you a brand new life when you become a son of God. Tonight, we want to head a bit further and deeper into this and we want to talk about the mark of being a son, the mark of being a son. Now we began by outlining the truth that spiritual life begins with a new birth. That's something that we need to be able to appreciate. Spiritual life begins with a new birth. Spiritual life is not something you grow into. It is not that you attend church so regularly that spiritual life begins. Spiritual life does not begin until there is a new birth. So just like when you are born the first time, you begin to grow outside of the womb. I want to say that when you are born of Christ, you begin your spiritual life, your spiritual journey. But I also want to highlight another truth that this new birth is followed by new life. Now that's very interesting. We are saying that spiritual life begins with a new birth. But this new birth is always followed by new life. In other words, we live a new kind of life. Now, now you would accept and realize that before you're born again, you're alive. You're alive physically. But according to Ephesians, you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. But when you come to Christ and you're born again, new life begins. New life begins. We don't achieve this by doing good works. But when we are born again, when we accept Christ into our lives um, through faith and by the grace of God, then there are marked changes that happen in our life. So, so when we are born again, we are born of God, we begin a new spiritual journey. Um, the good deeds don't earn our salvation. But the good deeds will follow our salvation. They are born out of our salvation. So we don't do enough good deeds to merit 
our, our, our life in Christ, to merit the new life. But when this new life comes, it is evidenced by good works. So spiritual life is marked by a quality of life that is different. That's something that we need to be able to grasp and appreciate. When, when you are born of God, there needs to be a marked difference in the way that you live. Um, we, we, we are not persons who become saved by just changing how we live. We, we become saved by accepting Jesus Christ into our hearts and being born, born again. When we are born again, then there is a marked difference in the way that we live, the way that we behave. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Ephesians 2, 8, we referenced it earlier. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace, by God's divine favor, are you saved through faith. You exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not of yourself. It doesn't originate with you. It is a gift. It comes from God. So it originates with God. That's very important for us to understand. Salvation comes from God, not of works. We, we don't earn it. We don't achieve it. We accept the gift, lest any man should boast. So, so Paul said that he, he doesn't boast in anything else, but in Christ. Um, and so we need to boast in Christ, not in ourselves, that we achieved the salvation because we didn't, but in Christ, because Christ um, paid the price and earned that salvation for us. And gives that salvation to us as a gift. And when we receive the salvation, he calls us his sons. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So there needs to be a marked difference in the life of the person who accepts Jesus Christ. That's the mark of the son. The difference, the change that occurs in your life. Sometimes that change is an instant change. There are other times that the change is a progressive change, but we are new. We are new. It is part of the mystery um, that, that exists in our sonship. We, we may look the same physically. We may have the same address. We may have the same telephone number, but something is different in us. Something spiritually has happened. The new birth affects that kind of change in us that transforms us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and, and brings us across from death unto life. And so I, I just want to ask you a question, some, something for you to think about. Now, let's just assume that person A becomes born again. He, he has been a smoker all his life. He becomes born again and he struggles with cigarettes for a number of years. He's not convinced that it is what he should do. He, he feels badly every time he picks one up and he comes back to his father and repents and he struggles and he fights until one day he's able to put them down for good. Person B comes to Christ and accepts him as his Lord and Savior. But from the time he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior, he never touches a cigarette again. Now, now, which person, person A or person B, do you think pleases his father more? Person A, the one who goes through the struggle and fights and fights until he gets to the place where, where he knows that he's pleasing his master? Or person B, who doesn't have that kind of struggle, but from the time he makes... Um, Jesus, his Lord, he doesn't have that struggle anymore. Now, now, I don't think that any of us has the answer to that question. Because the, the, the change that comes about is a spiritual change. It happens in the person's life. It happens in the person's life. And 
There are times when persons struggle with challenges and issues, but their heart is in the right place and they come running back to their father and he embraces them and he forgives them because these are his sons. And that's how the love of God is manifested in our lives. Now, now the Bible says in Colossians 3, 1, that if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above and not on the things of the earth. And there are people whose affections had been set on the things of the earth for all their lives. And so they've come to Christ. They have accepted him. The, the new birth um, is effected in their life and, and their struggle sometimes. It's a struggle. They want to um, go after the things that are above, but they struggle um, with the craving for the things that are below. And so as Paul wrote to the churches, you'll realize that he gets very practical. He wants them to have the mark of the sons of God. He wants them to look like the sons of God. He wants that by their actions and their deeds, people can identify them as sons of God. But he understands that because they live in a real world, that from time to time, tests and trials and temptations come against them. And there are times when the lower nature seeks to try to dominate their lives. And he writes some very practical things to them. He says to them things like, but now you also need to put off these things, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth. Now, why would Paul need to tell a church this? These people are sons of God already. They've embraced him. They've accepted him. But Paul gets practical and he's saying to them, now that you have embraced Christ, the new life necessitates that you put off these things. It has to be a, a daily putting off. In other words, you need to live the saved life. Um, Christ gives you the power to live above all these things um, because he lives in you. The spirit of God lives in you. You are God's son. You are God's child and you have power over all these things. So ensure that every day you put them off. Don't allow them to dominate you. Lie not to one another saying that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And he's saying to them, therefore, as the elect of God, put on bubbles of mercy, kindness, humbleness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love or charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So, so there is a change that takes place on the inside. The, the child of God is given the power to live above these things. And so Paul is challenging him not to allow the old nature to dominate your life, but embrace the power of Christ in your life and live above these things which are considered the works of the flesh. Now, I'm sure that you will agree with me that as a child of God, because you are born of God, it doesn't mean that you never have a struggle again in your life. Christians fall. Christians fail. We run into trouble sometimes. We meet difficult spots. But, but, but the mark of the sun is that you want to please God. There, there is something that is different about you. And so whenever you run into trouble, whenever you miss the mark, you feel a sense of guilt because you want to please your master. And God understands this and he reaches his hands to you and embraces you because you are his son. Um, it's important. Paul even wrote, Paul was the most outstanding apostle, many, many say in the New Testament. And Paul talks about things like the things that I know I ought to do. I don't do them. And the things that I need to avoid, I find myself doing them. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. And there are those of us who sometimes feel that that's where we are. We, we've started the journey. And, and we believe that every day we ought to be doing that which is good and that which is right. But sometimes we find ourselves failing. But the good thing is that God never fails us because he is our God and he recognizes us as his children. And so, there, there is a kind of character 
that the child of God develops that separates him from the people of the world. Um, there, there, there is a kind of lifestyle that we adopt that, that distinguishes us from the people of the world. The, the, the love of Christ and the power of Christ in us gives us the power to live above sin. There's a quote that I love that says, What matters most is not the character of our outward clothing, but the clothing of our inward character. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So, so there is something that changes in us from the inside out. From the inside out. And like I said, there are times that we have our struggles. But there's an inward character. And even in times of struggle, we want to please our master. And so we're willing to correct our wrongs. We're willing to have our sins forgiven. We, we acknowledge that we have an advocate with the Father and we want to make it right with him. That's the mark of the child of God. We, we don't continue in sin that grace may abound. We, we understand when we miss the mark and we want to make it right with Almighty God. So I don't want to make you think for a minute that because you are born again, you are born of God, you are a son of God, it means smooth sailing until we reach the promised land. No, there are times when life takes us on detours, when we have challenges and we have difficulties, where we find ourselves in places where we shouldn't be. But God reaches down in his love. And if we are willing to repent and return, God embraces us as his children. So if we are children of God, we should, we should have the likeness of God upon us. That's the mark, the likeness of God. Um, and, and, and there are a number of things that highlight the likeness of God in, in his people. Um, in Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48, Jesus said things like this. You have heard it that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, no, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. That's, that's the mark of the son. Persons who are willing to do this, love their enemies, bless those um, that, that, that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your heavenly Father which is in heaven. Um, that's the mark of the children of God. We are the people who will be willing to forgive. We are the people who will be willing to bless. And it's not because in ourselves we are capable of doing that, but it's because we have been born again and the power of Christ in our lives enables us to live above the desires of the flesh. If we are the children of God, we need to bear the likeness of the Father. The Son bears the likeness of the Father. We, we looked at the nature versus nurture debate earlier. And, and we said that when, when it comes to nature, um, the argument is that um, your DNA is something that is passed on to you. Um, there are genetics that are involved. And so um, you, you bear some resemblance of your predecessors. Um, and, and the thing about it is that then there is the nurture debate that talks about your behaviors and your habits. And they suggest that these are things that are learned behaviors because of your environment and your socialization. And we are saying that um, as it relates to this debate, it refers to us as the children of God. And it refers to our mark as well. Because there are some things that we have in us because we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And they are deposits of God in our lives by virtue of the fact that we've begun spiritual life. But then there are things that we learn. There are things, there are areas that we grow in, in Christ likeness and in the disciplines because of our spiritual environment, because we've set our affections, like the verse we read early in Colossians, on things above. And, and so we acquire spiritual food and we grow in Christ likeness. So it's important that we bear the image of our Father. If we are His sons, then we need to bear His image. Um, the image of God has forgiveness. The image of God 
is an image of forgiveness. The image of God is an image of love. And so sons of God forgive. Sons of God love. Um, over and over in scripture, we are told, forgive as your father has forgiven you. There is forgiveness in the father, so there ought to be forgiveness in the sons, his sons. There is love in the father, so there ought to be love in the sons. Um, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. If we are children of God, then over and over in scripture we are told, love as the Father has loved you. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. So those who are born of God, part of the mark that we have is that we love each other. And I want to, just highlight, um, to, to cap this off, the idea that we are sons, a parable that Jesus told. It was an important parable that highlights how the father views his sons. It's a parable that shows the great love that God has for his children and the fact that his forgiveness is available to us when we fail and when we fall. And, and we have highlighted tonight that there are times when we've embraced Christ. We've embraced Christ. And there are times when we, we allow the flesh to take over and we begin to make decisions that we should not make. And I want to say to us that because we are sons of God, God does not abandon us at those points. But he's waiting for us, beckoning to us to come back so that he can restore us, so that he can renew us. So that we can know that we are again sons of God. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 15, and I know that you know this parable. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered wandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am here perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion on him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now this parable, and remember, um, we, we, you probably grew up hearing that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, Jesus told parables to teach deep spiritual truths. And the truth here is the fact that our Father never gives up on us. And I want to say that your Father loves you. If you're His Son, He loves you. In fact, Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 says, God loves us with an everlasting love. And there is nothing that you can do 
that can stop God from loving you. Nothing you'll do that will stop God from loving you. Nothing that you've done in your past that will stop God from loving you. God loves you with an everlasting love. You've made some mistakes, but your father still loves you. You may have turned to your own ways, but your father still loves you because you are his son. You may have walked away from the path, but your father still loves you. Your father loves you. Also, your father never gives up on you. You know, the fact that he was standing, he was looking for his son. And the reason why we know that he was looking for his son was because he saw him when he was a far way off. He didn't hear a knock on the door and went to answer the door and was surprised to see his son. But he was looking for him. He was looking for him. He was longing for him to return. Your father does not give up on you. The Lord our God does not give up on us, his children. And so I want to say to you that if you um, have accepted Christ, you've been born again, but, but you found yourself in a tough place, a rough spot where you found that you're making decisions that you shouldn't be making. God hasn't given up on you. And, and you need to follow the example of this son in this parable and return home to your father. You know why? Because your father never turns you away. The Bible said that when he was a far way off, his father saw him. He didn't wait for him to come and apologize. He did not plan out his I told you so speech. But he ran toward him. And, and I'm told that it was not dignified for a Jewish man to run. They, they didn't run. Running was not for them. Um, but, but his father saw him. And he forgot about what was the dignified thing for a Jewish man to do. He ran toward his son when he was a far way off. Um, he embraced him. He kissed him. That's what our father does. He waits for us to come to him. You see, when Christ died for you, he died that he, that he might have you in his family forever. That's what he wants. To have you in his family forever. That you may have eternal life. And there are times when we step out of line. But our father doesn't give up on us. He, he never turns us away when we return and when we repent. His father was there with open arms. And, and God our father is there with open arms when we come back to him. And he's willing to restore us. Now the son acknowledged his faults. Acknowledged his failings. And he said, you know, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. But that's not the way God does his business. Because he sees you as his son. He knows the work that he's done in your life. And if you're repentant, he will reinstate you. He will restore you. So he said, bring the fatted calf. Bring the robe. Bring the ring. Bring the shoes. Because this is my son. This is my son. And so I, I just felt tonight like challenging someone. You know, challenging one of the sons of God who may have gone on their own journey. Strayed from the path. Know that your father is waiting on you. Know that God is beckoning for you to come back home to him. He has a robe waiting for you and a ring to put on your finger to show that you are owned. You belong to him. Shoes to put on your feet. That's the God that we serve. A God who never gives up on his children. It's beautiful to be a son of God. To know that we are serving a God who pursues us. He pursues us. And when he wins us over. And, and he, he cleans us up. And he washes us. And we stray away from him. He doesn't get frustrated and say, you know what? I did so much for you in the first place. That you should never turn your back on me. The Bible says he's just waiting for us to come back home. So that he can embrace us and reinstate us into his family. The example was set with the, the Lord Jesus himself. With Peter. When Peter said, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. Um, before the cock crowed. Peter had denied Jesus three times. 
but Jesus reinstated Peter. And Peter was the one who stood on the day of Pentecost as a son of God and said, these men are not drunk as he supposed, but this is what was prophesied. And then he preached Christ and thousands of persons gave their life to the Lord. I want to say to you that if you strayed from the path, know that God still has a plan for you. You just need to come back to him, be reinstated, and God will work his plan out in your life. So I want to challenge you today to have the mark of the child of God. Because you're saved, then your life ought to be lived out with good works. That persons can recognize that there is something that is different about you. Because you are changed, there is something that is remarkably different about you. Um, represent the kingdom of God well. Represent the family of God well. When people look at you, I, I pray that they will see the mark of God upon your life. A Christian is a son. There's a sense of belonging upon your life. And so we must walk like Jesus. We must live like Jesus so that our lives will impact the world with the character of Almighty God. So I want to challenge you to go to your community and walk like a son of God. Go to your workplace and walk like a son of God. Walk upright. Let, let persons see the light of Christ in you. Um, before your enemies, walk like a child of God. Um, in front of your friends, walk like a son of God. In front of your family, walk like a son of God. Let the love and the joy and the peace and the forgiveness and the hallmarks of Christ be evident in your life. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You are a son of God if you've embraced Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. Ears of God, joint ears with Jesus, new creatures in Christ. Um, you are ordained for great and outstanding work because you are the workmanship of God in Christ. Um, you have been created for good works and God wants to have that those good works revealed through your life. Thank you for joining us this evening for another World Changers Bible Study. We want you to join us again next time as we continue to look at what in the world is a Christian. And in our next session, we're going to be talking about the fact that the Christian is a saint. The Christian is a saint. You don't want to miss that. Please join us on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and we look forward to having you join us next time. May God richly bless you.